And hello, welcome to Solo Playthroughs. We are finally getting the other Chip Theory game on the channel. I guess there's four of them, really, if we're going Burn Cycle and as well as Hoppelmachus, and I'm sure there's one or two I might not even know about. But this is the other one for me, right? When I first jumped into Chip Theory games, it was in the Horizons Wrath Kickstarter that came with the Uprising and Horizons Wrath as the newest factions to Cloudspire. I went gameplay all in, and I was like, let me pick up this zany other game called Too Many Bones. Really thought I was going to get Cloudspire on the channel first, and life just had other ideas. I read the Cloudspire rulebook first, but really started to play too many bones first based on friends that I had over. I had a friend who had played too many bones. I read through that rule book. I had no idea what was going on and I knew I needed help. And my friend Dave was in town. I was like, Dave, teach me what the heck I am doing in this game. And really just took a deeper dive into that one as my first stop in the Chip Theory Games universe. And I'm not going to lie, my first game of Classifier was also a big part of that. I played against my friend Steve and we did the walkthrough in the rule book and I found the rulebook pretty accessible. I don't think it's the greatest, though, because when you're actually playing, it doesn't really explain what you need to do. I mean, <laughs> it's nice to have a 45-minute walkthrough of what's happening, but you still don't gain that much understanding of actually how to play. And I played as the Bronwyn, and Steve played as the Grove Sanders, and he had watched a couple of playthroughs. I was coming in way more cold than him. I had basically just read the rules. And I swear that walkthrough, if you follow it to a T, by the end of it, Grove Tenders have a positional advantage. They have a material advantage for chess players. You'll appreciate both of those phrases. And they also have initiative in the next wave. And it was unbelievable. Steve crushed me. I didn't even have a chance. And he'll even tell you too. Like it just was so ridiculous. It wasn't like I played great. It was my first game ever. I was just kind of figuring it out. But unbelievable. He had a couple of relics that were super strong for him. And he totally wiped me out. Which to the point that we were halfway through the second wave. I was like, this isn't fun. I'm done. I'll learn this later. And I just conceded. And <laughs> I mean, Steve played it out anyway. And I think by the end of the second wave, I had two health left. And he was just loaded for bear with this hero right by my gate for the next round. I mean, it was unbelievable. So that being said, it definitely took me a while to say, all right, when am I going to get that abomination out of the box again? And obviously I'm glad I did, but learning this game, even after that was maybe even a worse experience. <laughs> I mean, I spent days the first time I tried to figure out this rule book and learn all the keywords. And I'm not saying it's too many keywords. I think it's the right amount of keywords. You have a a lot of content. You need a lot of keywords. I get it. I get how Chip Theory Games works. I appreciate this game. It's really good. Oh, the rule book's awful. And for me, the biggest turning point was when I was like, you know what? I'm reading the rules reference cover to cover. And I did that. And finally, things started to click. Maybe that's just the way my brain works. And that's what I needed to do. And I'm giving this story as a cautionary tale of two things. One, if you're like me, who really struggled learning this game, Maybe read the rules reference. If you're like me, that will really help. The second thing is, if you were considering getting into this game, just be prepared for an investment of some amount of time before you can really start to appreciate what it is, how it operates, the challenges that it presents. It's a beast. The least fun I've had learning a game ever. Not even close. And I've learned a lot of games. This one was just absolutely brutal to learn. There is a reward there though. And you probably will hear <laughs> how much I like this game and the excitement I have approaching this game from that. This game is just an amazing puzzle. It's super interesting. There's a lot going on and the changing dynamic of the landscape and the enemies and what you're asked to consider every game. I mean, I've done this particular scenario at least two dozen times and I'm not even exaggerating because this is what I really learned on. And I kept playing it to like a three renown and I majorly cheated because I was making the architects super overpowered. <laughs> That's totally fine. And I learned that, I don't know, yesterday, but here we are. And I am just happy that I spent the time to actually learn this game. I've only played through the first four chapters of the solo modes. I am going to take this one faction at a time. I might do every scenario. I might just do four scenarios of the Bronin on my own and then go to scenario five and I will kind of follow the story as it is in the solo scenario book. Again, I do have the Greege, I do have Horizon's Wrath, and I do have the Uprising. So I do have all seven factions that have been released so far in Cloudspire. 
and maybe we'll get all 28 solo scenarios on here. Maybe I'll get Steve over here and we'll do a two player scenario as well. And obviously it's gonna depend on what you all want and what kind of engagement this video gets. And I do expect as always seems to be the case when I bring a game to the channel for the first time, there is probably going to be a rule, maybe two, that I have wrong. And please just put that in the comments. I will make sure I address that. As I have often said, come back after my videos are published for two weeks and see if I have edited the highlighted comment. That is where I tend to put rules mistakes that are of a certain level of severity, more than just like a simple oversight. But I've spent a lot of time to learn this one because I just know how important it is to get the rules right when it comes to chip theory, especially in this game, probably even more so than Too Many Bones. I mean, Too Many Bones is just a zany, crazy, wacky experience. This game is much more chessy and puzzle and strategy and tactic and resource management. I mean, there's just so much going on in how this game comes together. So for those who do not know, Classifier can be played 1v1, it can be played multiplayer, beyond that, competitive, it can be played cooperative, it can be played in a whole bunch of different ways, there are cooperative scenarios, but the way the solo mode works is you get an entire book of solo scenarios, there are four solo scenarios for each of the factions, and then all of the expansions come with their own book that adds on to what you have in here. So what you have in here is the lore. The setup of this game is that you were on the land of Ankar. I assume I'm pronouncing that right. And the land of Ankar is a bunch of floating islands. Now, unfortunately, the source that keeps those islands afloat is running out. The islands are starting to wobble a little bit in the sky. They're starting to crash into each other as source gets scarce. The various factions are trying to fight each other now for dominance over Ankar, for control of the source. And that's where you're having this conflict. And part of this conflict, as we'll see in the flavor text for this one in particular, it's like they're almost looking for reasons to go to war with each other because of the tension and the situation with the source and looking out for themselves as they see their ecosystem kind of falling apart a little bit, right? So it's a really interesting world. It's a really interesting story. The factions are radically different, radically, radically different. And I have only played the Bronin a lot. They are the easiest, most accessible faction from what I understand, but I have seen the others in my solo plays to be like, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> So they're just nuts. What we're up against today is the airs. Airs are birds. They're in the air. It's clever. Something. The airs are spelled with an H though. So H-E-I-R-S. They think they are better than everybody else. That's just how they roll. The Bronin are more of like the brutes. They bring the strength. They can do some cool things when they're attacking. I will not try to teach the rules of this game up front. There's just too much, but we will obviously break down the rules as I go and I'll take my time here a little bit today since this is the first class buyer playthrough on the channel. So I do want to get a couple of things sorted before we start. These three stacks of black chips in the center, these make up your market. If you have the base game, you only have about 20 of these and then the expansions add a lot more. I do have portal seekers and especially once you get the uprising, they add a lot more and you can mix all these black chips together as long as they have that in the background, the chips do have little symbols on the front if you did want to separate the expansions later, but I just had them all together. It just became too much of a storage pain for me to try to keep them all separate. I'm just going to give these a quick shuffle. The market has three different chips that come out every round. I will have three opportunities over the course of this game to buy a chip from the market, and we'll see if I decide to do that. Some chips are actually the mercenaries that I can treat as minions of my own faction. Some of them are equipment that I can put on my hero if my hero were to be back in the base. And some of them are actually spires. And then what are the spires? The spires are things that are shooting at the opponents at a allotted time whenever the opponents take a movement, if the opponents move within range of one of your spires. So we're gonna turn these into three different piles. Not gonna go too crazy. They're pretty randomized. Ding, ding, and I'm just gonna put them over here in this chip tray. So that is our market. The rest of these I've splayed out in a certain place so you can see what is where. We have two sets of hell chips. I do have some extra hell chips over here to the left. We have the die. These are landmark chips. We'll set those up as I get into the setup for the scenario. And these are two of the double-sided landmark and market talent sheets 
So I'll just lay them one over the other. We'll be referring to that a lot. The market talents would be any keywords that are on the different market chips and the landmark talents are any keywords that will be on these chips right here. Again, there are different kinds of landmarks. Notice I do have the swamp landmarks separated out from the other kinds of landmarks and you'll see why I did that in a second. So to my left over here, we have the Braunen Fortress and to the right over here, we have the Ayers Fortress. Each fortress has a source meter. The source meter is really hard to see even for me sitting at this table. So I will probably just use a D20 to keep track of that. And then we have a health meter. My fortress gate starts with 10. The heirs have a health meter. They start with 10 and they also start with zero source such as I do. These little tokens, you'll see what they do as we go. They are to represent various upgrades you make in your fortress. And for the Braunen, they're super important because that's how you actually promote your units because you have various units. So here are my barracks, various units. They have a non-promoted side, which does not have a star. And then a promoted side, which has a star. The promoted side always has slightly better movement or slightly better attack or even additional talents that really help it. Beyond each unit having a unpromoted side and the promoted side, you really have three kinds of units. You have minions, which have like a bronzes border around them. You have heroes, which have a goldish border around them. Now in this scenario, we are specifically told we can only use Cram the Almighty and he's gonna start on the board, which is why I have him splayed out over there. And then we have spires. You have two different kinds of spires. And again, similar, just like the units, there is one side that does not have a star. And then through various upgrades in our fortress, we can get to the other side, which does have a star. So that will go there. This Braunen sheet is double-sided because <laughs> like all things with chip theory, there is so much information. You do need to use both sides. So this one side basically tells me my options for spending source for upgrades. This other side shows me all my various heroes and minions and what their abilities are both on their promoted side and their non-promoted side as well. So that is that. So let's get into this first scenario because this is where it all starts, kids. Story time with Greg Braunen, chapter one. When Cram the Mighty entered the cellar, he was not surprised to see the Braunen premier, Osh, nor Cram's own lieutenant, Claff. What left the general momentarily speechless was the other figure in the room, the one his countrymen had been focused on at the time of his arrival, a mildly bludgeoned, fully mature heir, currently hogtied to a support beam near the room's back wall. Its rumpled gray feathers marked it, if Cram wasn't mistaken, as a pigeon blood heir. Pigeon bloods and other heirs of similar persuasion were known for their maneuverability and endurance during flight, making them excellent scouts. Cram knew all of this at a glance, but it took a moment longer to reform this information into the circumstance he knew must have occurred. A contingent of Claff's people must have downed an air scout flying in the skies of a thread. Such scouting by either race on the land of the other was banned by a treaty between Thrad and the air island of Will. But the military leadership of both nation states suspected that the opposition was engaged in subterfuge regardless. Cram had authorized similar covert Braunen forays into the outer reaches of Will, but at present none of his army spies had been caught. This is exactly what we've needed to justify further action against the heirs, Osh murmured, placing one hand on Cram's shoulder. I want you in the field in two days. Spend tonight formulating your battle plan and have it to me by midday. We will make sure that all of Thrad knows about this air incursion. The people will be behind you. I want you to strike quickly. Up to the gates of testament if you can. I don't care how you do it, but Cram, make sure you bring our architects with you. I want an influx of source as soon as possible. Dun, dun, dun. So that is the flavor text and the introduction to all of this gloriousness. So we have the battle mat for the first scenario. It looks like this. See, see what I did here? So you're told exactly which of these you should be using. With the expansion, I think there's 11 or 12 of them total. We're only starting with four of the big islands. They are all joined up as so. Now, spires go on places that have source wells. Over here, it tells us what starts on the map. Now, a lot of these dots are going to be for various spires. However, two of them are going to be for heroes, one for the heirs, one for Cram. And the heirs leader actually doesn't start on the map itself. He will start basically in the fortress of the heirs. So A corresponds to this spot here. A is going to be a high rise. So I have a high rise token 
And normally when you're building spires, you'll put on the number of upgrade chips that are actually depicted on the spire. However, these are such finely tuned scenarios that they kind of tweak that and you just want to follow these instructions instead. So the book overrules kind of what's on the chip. But if you were playing as the heirs and I were to build a high rise, you would normally just get one attack chip and one range chip. Here we're getting one attack chip and two range chips. So when Spires attack, they will roll a number of dice equal to their number of attack chips. So this high rise is only going to roll one attack chip. Additionally, it will be able to target a Brawnen that is within three hexes. Why three hexes? Well, it has two range chips. It has a base range of one, meaning that it can attack adjacent. For every range chip it has, it can go one more away. So again, it has range three. It will be able to attack any Brawnen that's there, 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 etc. So that is the first spire we built. We're going to go to B. B is the minaret. Minaret's huge. A normal minaret only comes in with what? One attack chip, one range chip. Well, this is a really special spire. This spire has two attack chips, so it will roll two dice if it attacks. It also has two range chips, so again, it will have range three, just like the high rise, and five fortification chips. What are fortification chips? When a spire takes damage, you just get rid of the bottom chip. So it doesn't matter how much damage you do. If I do 17 damage to a Spire, which would be really hard on this game to do that at one time, I'm only taking away one chip. Fortifications are special because they require that for you to get rid of that bottom chip, you have to do at least two damage. So if I do one damage to this Minaret, guess what? The Minaret's going to be like, ha, 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 ha. That just tickled. You actually need to roll two. It's not like I can say, well, I'll just take the bottommost chip that only takes one. No, 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 no. You have to get through the fortifications first before you can get into the range chips and you get into the attack chips. That does bring up a point that we will be adding chips to Spires as we go. The only thing that matters, whether you need one damage or two damage to actually remove a chip, is what is the status of that bottom chip. If there were an attack chip on the bottom of these five fortification chips, one damage to that attack chip would be sufficient to take that chip out from the bottom. The Minaret has a talent. The talent is air defense. What does that mean? It just means that it can do damage to a unit that is flying. It doesn't have anything to do with its own defense. It has air defense for the airs that it can attack things that are in the air that are coming at the air's fortress. Now we go to number three. Number three is a high rise. It's gonna go here. This is the same kind of spire as this one. It, all it has is one attack and one fortification chip. So it's only attacking adjacent enemies. It's not going to do anything else but attack anything that's within range one. And then finally, we have the Regal Lookout. Regal Lookout's pretty nuts. Regal Lookout normally comes in with one attack chip and one range chip. This one's actually going to come in with two. So I was missing a chip over here. Sorry about that. We'll put that right there. And we have a couple of talents on the Regal Lookout. Now you notice this Regal Lookout and the Minaret have stars on it. That just means that they're the promoted versions of other kinds of buildings that the heirs can build. The star spires tend to be a little bit better than the other spires, but there are times that's not always true. But the Regal Lookout has one Elfin. That means at the beginning of a wave, it's gonna get an Elfin Kazi. Yes, it's a play on words for common Kazi. So that will give you some idea of what the Elfin Kazi does. The Elfin Kazi comes in, it has one health, so the beginning of a wave, the Elfin Kazi is going to come in and it's going to go on top of the Regal Lookout. Not because of a keyword on the Elfin Kazi, but because of the keyword on the Regal Lookout. So you're going to have one Elfin Kazi that's going to go right there. Now, three Roost is also on the Regal Lookout. That's going to come into play because of the keywords on the Elfin Kazi. The Elfin Kazi has a bunch of different keywords and it is two-sided. We are specifically told to use the Elfin Kazi that has Glide Bomb on it as opposed to the Elfin Kazi that has Save. Save is an ability that if you're playing as the heirs, you could use to heal some of your units on the battle mat. The Glide Bomb is what you think. Again, this is an Elfin Kazi for a reason. If one of our leaders gets close enough to the Elfin Kazi, specifically in this scenario, because we're only allowed to use Cram, if Cram, the only leader we're going to have in play, gets close enough to the Elfin Kazi, the Elfin Kazi will be able to move three and it will be able to do two damage to Cram. But additionally, anything else that is adjacent to the Elfin Kazi when it explodes virtually, right? And then the Elfin Kazi comes out of the game. If the Regal Lookout's still there, one Elfin will trigger again the next wave and we'll get another Elfin Kazi. Now, why could the Elfin Kazi move three? Well, it can move three because of three roost. That tells you how far the Elfin Kazi can go. Now, the Elfin Kazi will only move off of the Regal Lookout 
at a defined moment in the action, and I'll explain that as we go. So the other keywords on the Alphakazi include flying. What that means is that for it to be attacked, it needs to be attacked by one of my units that has, guess what? Air defense. It's all coming full circle, kids. We also have precious. That means if the Alphakazi are the only minion type still in play, the wave can still end. Why that's important is normally, if I had defeated all of the minions of the errors and the only thing I have left are cram, normally the round ends. However, if the Elf and Kazi are still in play, the round will still end, right? Because normally you're waiting for all the units of the other side to go away. In this case, you're not. The Elf and Kazi would just leave and then a new one will spawn as per the one Elf and the next round. So I already talked about flying, talked about precious, talked about glide bomb. The last phrase on there is roost roam. That just has to do with the attacking mechanic of the Elf and Kazi. Again, if there is a leader within three, when the Elfenkazi is a leading minion, they will move. I just said another phrase there, leading minion. Leading minion just determines the order that the minions will move, both for you, because your minions move in a very particular order, as well as for the errors when you're controlling the AI for the opponent. The leading minion is the one that has the fewest steps to their target. The target for the minions for the errors is the fortress gate. Now that does include terrain allotments, which I'll get into. The Alphankazi can cover all terrain. So sometimes even if they're a step or two seemingly further back, they still might be the leading minion because their terrain allotment will allow them to make up ground and get there quicker anyway. If you wanna see a bunch of crazy threads, Google classifier Alphankazi questions. There are a ton of them. This is probably the most complicated part of anything I've played in the first four scenarios, getting the mechanics of the Alphankazi down and figuring out how they're actually supposed to work. The Alphankazi gave me a good opportunity to talk about a couple other pieces of information on these chips. The one is related to the same idea of terrain allotment. There was a helpful chart on the back of the book for terrain allotment. So there is either no icon, which means that a minion can only go on the path hexes, or there might be a planes icon, which means they can only go on path hexes in there, or there might be a tree icon, which means you can go on path hexes there or trees, or there might be a rock icon, which Cram has, which means you can go on the three types of terrain I just mentioned, additionally go on rocks, or there could be a water icon, like a wave, which means you can go anywhere the heck you want, and Elf and Kazi is flying, so it shouldn't be surprising that it has a wave. The other piece of information on these chips, one is the source cost. If you were to try to build one of these spires, but again, we're not playing as the air, so we ourselves would not be building these spires, but my spires have the same kind of thing, the source cost. There is also the source reward. So if I were to kill the high rise, I would get three source reward. If I were to defeat an Elf and Kazi, I would get two source reward. If an Elf and Kazi blew itself up, and I'll get that reward. I have to defeat it with something that has an air defense keyword. If I were to defeat this minaret, despite all these ships there, I only get one source reward. Additionally, I'll talk about Cram right now. Cram has these two dots down here. If he defeats something, he can additionally take an upgrade. When Cram takes an upgrade, he can take either an attack upgrade or a fortification upgrade. He cannot take a range upgrade because he doesn't have a range attack. However, if he had the ability to do a range attack, he could take an upgrade due to that. And he is limited to two upgrades. If he were to take a third upgrade, instead of taking that third upgrade, he would actually get rid of both of the upgrades he already has, and he will flip his chip over. I will say that the attack chips and the fortification chips work a little bit differently when they're on your hero than they do when they're on a spire. A fortification chip goes on the bottom, it just behaves like another piece of health. It does not require two pieces of damage to take that away. Again, it's just like extra health. It can be really, really important to make sure to have the extra health when you can get it. Meanwhile, the attack chip, unlike the spires who roll dice equal to the number of attack chips, the heroes and the minions, they just do X amount of damage. In Cram's case, X is two, because there's a two on there plus however many attack chips he has. He's only gonna be maxed out at two at the most, at least on this side. So the most he'll be able to do in one attack is four. But again, you would add those two together. You're not rolling dice. It's just an automatic thing. He attacks, that's how much damage he does, period. It's also how much he would retaliate. If Cram were attacked, not by Spire, but by one of the opposing units, he will do damage and retaliation equal to his attack stat plus how many attack chips that he has. The cram is splayed out here because we go back to our map. It says that cram starts right next to the fortress gate. 
and he has five health chips. Now that is his normal amount of health. It was just making it really clear, hey, put five health chips underneath him and call it a day. Normally Cram would cost seven points, seven command points to put on the battle mat, but we're getting him for free at the beginning of this scenario. Guys, don't forget that beautiful man with that beautiful, beautiful beard. I know I'm a little biased. He was sent out to the battle mat because those silly heirs are doing some silly scouting. Now we have Darb over here. This is the sixth chip. Darb is going to start on the heirs gate. Darb normally would come into play with just three health. Instead, Darb's going to have another attack chip, which means that it's going to have an attack stat of two at the start of the game. Instead of its normal attack of a one, it's going to have five health chips. And because of the little star there, Darb's going to come in on its promoted side. It has also water terrain. So like the Alphankazi, it can move anywhere. It's also worth two sources of reward when it's defeated, if it's defeated, I should say. And it has another keyword in addition to flying, which is dodge. If I were to defeat Darb from attacking or retaliation by a unit, instead of it being defeated, it would just flip over, lose all of its upgrades, which could be really important in this scenario. And then it would just retain its current health. It just makes him a little bit more annoying to kill. Plus if you defeat him on his non-promoted side, you only get one source reward instead of the two that you get from the promoted side. Threw a lot out there. <laughs> that was me not trying to go through all of the rules. There's a ton going on with this game. Now, I need to do a couple more things. You'll notice that we still have three open source wells on this board. The heirs, because this is their home, they have already filled a lot of the land by their fortress. We have really taken our fortress flown it through the air, landed onto the side of their island, and now we're there to wreak havoc. All these source wells are going to have landmarks on top of them, and eventually will give me an opportunity to build spires as well. So we're going to put two swamp landmarks on two of these source wells. Each source well that is closest to each fortress gate gets a swamp. It's a little weird on this map because while this one's obvious, this one is not so obvious. That is the closest open source well to the gate of the heirs. So it leaves one source well left on the board. I'm just gonna lay those out, lay those out, and I'm gonna roll a D20. Where's my D20? I rolled a 15. So three, six, nine, 12, 13, 14. It's another swamp landmark that's totally legit. You are supposed to shuffle the rest of the swamps back in after setting up the ones that you guarantee to be swamps, they could absolutely come out that way. The swamps are actually better for me. They are more advantageous for me because they're usually the most consistent source of source for me. <laughs> As you get this game started, each point of source you can get early is really important. Now, one more thing I need to do before I leave this page, there are special setup instructions on Ignition. Again, this is the first scenario. So I'm supposed to roll a D6. I'm going to roll the Cloud Spire D6. I roll the five. It tells me to swap the spires on B and D. So the Elf and Kazi is going to move over here. And this big minaret is going to move over here. And that absolutely will have a big impact on strategy as we approach this scenario, for sure. At least have an impact on potential strategy. If anything, I think it'll be a little helpful in that we won't have to worry about this minaret, which is going to be rolling two dice for a little bit. When it's there, that's a lot of bad attacks early on us as we're trying to be there. But the Elfin Kazi is almost guaranteed to do a little Elfin Kazi bombing on us earlier than maybe it would have otherwise. All right. So let's get to the next page of this. We have objectives. The whole point of these solo scenarios in Cloud Spire is you're trying to get renown. To get renown, you need to complete at least one of three objectives. If you complete one of three, you win the scenario. However, if you want a super, super win, you really want to try to get all three. The narrative goes out from there. So you can't keep replaying until you get three. That's kind of my preferred way of playing. However, I think for this series, this video, I'll just kind of keep the story as it goes. And if I get one renown and I win, great, we'll move on. Renown can be spent to get a rewards. There's a chart in this book that tells you how you can spend Renown, blah, 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 blah. I'm not a big fan of mechanics like that in games. I probably won't do that, but some of those powers are pretty strong. We'll see. Maybe I'll change my tune the more I get into and explore this game. But the three objectives I'm looking at is I need to defeat all Minaret Spires by the end of Wave 4. So there's a Minaret Spire there. 
There is not another one on the board yet. All air spires are defeated at the end of wave four. So that's not only the minarets, but also the high rise, this high rise, and the real lookout, and defeat the air fortress gate. Scenario ends immediately. Be careful there, because if you defeat the air fortress gate before the spires are defeated, well, you'll get your one renown. That's all you're getting. If you have the minaret spires and the fortress gate defeated, well, you get two renown, but that's all you're getting. As soon as the fortress gate is defeated, yours or your opponents, in this scenario at least, that is the end. That's normally the end of most scenarios, but again, specifically, we're talking about this one, that would be the end of the scenario. The other way we would lose beyond losing our fortress gate is if Cram himself was defeated, so let's try to keep him alive. Scenario rules, Cram the Mighty, the only hero the Brawnen may have in play. The AI rules, Darb remains in the air fortress and is considered out of play until he is deployed in wave three, and then Marks. These chips are just to indicate the Marks. They're more useful in like a three or four player game, but we'll use them here. So the mark for the Brawnen minions is going to be the Fortress Gate of the Heirs, and the mark for the Heirs minions is going to be the Fortress Gate of the Brawnen. Darb has its own special marks. Darb is going to go after Cram the Mighty as his primary mark, and then the Brawnen Fortress Gate, and then it has an attack priority, Cram the Mighty, Opposing Fortress Gate, Opposing Spire, Opposing Faction Minion, and then leveling, you just ignore upgrade capacity when leveling. If Darb were to defeat either a minion or a spire of mine, it would take a default one attack chip. Leveling priority for the AI is always attack chips. However, there can be some wiggle room in other scenarios where we'll be more specific about the order that you're supposed to take attack chips. So there are different event die results at the beginning of every wave. We will roll a D6 and it will give us a random event that will further add to the puzzle and the replayability of this scenario. One thing I'm going to note is when I was first trying to learn this game, all of the AI talent references were at the beginning of this book, and it drove me absolutely bananas. I was like, why did they not put this in a separate book? Well, joke's on me. They did. Oh, those chip theory games, guys, are so amazing. So in the co-op scenario book, we have the same AI talents. It is verbatim the same exact words. They gave it to you twice, so you're not flipping through this book. Like an absolute lunatic. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Production note, I did just take the top of the dice tray off of the dice tray to get those other colored dice off because I noticed they were kind of reflecting through too much. So again, these are all Spire attack dice. These dice in the back, the three purple ones are for the heirs. The three gray ones are for the Bronin. We may see one or two of those depending on how I decide to build out my fortress. And we may not. This scenario book is pretty awesome. It tells you what's going on in each wave, and it tells you who has priority for each wave. So in wave one, the Bronin have priority. Again, we're on the attack, so we're the ones who are going to go first. We just arrived. Hello, Lucy, I'm home. And now we have to roll the event die. What's going to go on? I rolled a three. Three, we add a fortification chip to the bottom of two. I tell you two air spires of your choice so i'm gonna add one to this high rise in the back because who really cares and i'll add one to the one minaret to rule them all why not so that is done the event phase is over income phase zero source kids we get zero source all four rounds so don't get excited when i say income phase it's going to be zero unless i maybe build something that will give me a little bit and i just might i'll see how the first wave goes market phase as normal in a normal game of Cloudspire, the number of market chips is going to be the number of players plus one. In a solo game, you are supposed to put out three. The rules aren't totally clear about that, but that's absolutely the case. Now, I cannot buy any of this, <laughs> so I don't really care. But if I had any source, I might be interested in buying an extra minion. Minions are nice because they allow you to get something else that you can put on the battlefield just by spending the source to get them during the market phase, and you don't have to spend the command points to put them on the battlefield in the next phase. So it could be really, really helpful to give you another minion to do some damage. But remember, if you put a minion on the battlefield during a wave, that minion is not coming back. Minions go until they're defeated, no matter what. So one of the many things I haven't mentioned yet are these landscape tiles. Landscapes are pretty cool. We're not gonna be messing with these this scenario. I'd be very surprised. Landscapes give you a chance to kind of buy something for two source from the market, and then you can kind of put it out. You might be able to get another source well, there's a lot of things that go on with these little landscapes. The market is supposed to have one, so I'll just kind of shuffle these loosely, and then I'll just put this in a stack, and then we refresh the market every round. We'll just take the top landscape and put it off to the side. 
That's fine. I actually think I shuffled the same one right back on top. So this is technically also in the market. That's right. We are landscapers, kids. That's how this works. Let's go ahead into the next phase. So we have the build phase. The build phase is as normal. So if I had any source, I could spend it to upgrade my fortress. I could spend it to put spires on open source walls. Obviously there are no open source walls, so can't really do anything right now. Don't have any source anyway. Now we go to the prep phase. I have five command points to spend. I'm gonna get myself a Battleborn and a Dispatch. Now, you notice that right above the source reward for the Battleborn and the source reward for the Dispatch is a number that is in yellow. So it's a white number with a yellow background. That tells you how much command points you have to spend to get them into battle. And now I have to choose how I want to stack them. Do I want to group them? Do I want to keep them separate? There's advantages and disadvantages to both. I will keep them separate. So I'm gonna put three health underneath the dispatch, three health underneath the Battleborn, and I'm putting them in the opening of my fortress, and they will be ready to enter the battle mat once the wave begins in earnest. What am I doing for the heirs? The heirs have three different units listed here. So Harrier with a star, so it's gonna be the upgraded Harrier, and another one, and another one. So three promoted Harriers. They are also in brackets. That means they are going to be grouped. So I'm going to take the three Harrier chips. I'm going to make sure they're all promoted side face up. Here we go. And I'm going to keep them right on top of each other. And underneath that stack of three chips, we're going to put two health chips. Why putting two health chips? Well, that represents the health of the top Harrier. If this Harrier is defeated, he goes away. The next Harrier enters his place. So you see some of the strategy that come in there. If I have a unit that I think will be really effective somewhere in the middle of the board, maybe I kind of hide them and try to keep them safe for a little bit, and then they could do more damage later in a wave. So this is it. Beginning of wave one, we're going to start with the Brawnen. I have to let my minions get out of the gate if they can. The Dispatch are going to move two. The Battleborn are supposed to move two. They only have Path Allowance, so... They can't actually use all their movement. You always want to use all the movement if you can, and you always need to make progress toward the mark. So the Battleborn says, I can't move the full two. I'll reduce their movement value to one. They can move the one right there. That's their only option. Cram, I could have moved him before or after the minions. Had I moved him before the minions, though, they would have displaced him to move back. A hero can never be the reason why a minion does not move its full movement. Instead, they will displace it. Another minion, though, can block a minion behind it. So that's something you want to use to your advantage. But if I had moved Cram here and left him in the path, he would have been displaced all the way back into the fortress, which would have meant I would have had no access to him for the rest of the wave. That would not have been good. Now, we're going to go to our handy-dandy chart at the back of the rules reference and go through the rest of the sequence of the onslaught phase. This is all the onslaught phase. This is where most of the action happens. After I move, I'm going to check to see if there are any spires of the heirs within range to attack me. Range 3 from this high rise gets it into this area. Range 3 from there gets it into range of this area, but they all cannot reach the dispatch. They're really close though, but not quite. So I now do exploration. In exploration, I can do flip up any adjacent landmarks. If I have to do it one at a time and decide if I want to reveal it or not. Sometimes the choice is taken out of your hands, but we'll see if that's what happens here. I flip this over. It is a Sabisa. A Sabisa is a wonderful thing to see early. It comes into play with four health, and it's chilling right there in a source well saying, yo, what's up? The Sabisa has toxic secretion. That means for every point of movement that you move by it, you will take one damage. So if I were back here and I move the dispatch here, that's one point of damage, here another point of damage, right? Really nasty. It's really effective to use a Sabisa against the opponents. Say the Sabisa was like here instead, as they came around that bend, yoink, just start taking off some of their health. But now I wanna kill a Sabisa, I wanna get that source reward, so let's do that. Minions have to attack if they can. The dispatch is going to attack the Sabisa, done. The Battleborn is gonna attack the Sabisa, done. And Cram the Almighty is going to attack the Sabisa. Cram the Almighty is doing two damage, so we finish it off. So one damage from the Dispatch because of that stat, one damage from the Battleborn because of that stat, and Cram the Almighty does two. Now, one thing I should mention about the Dispatch, Dispatch's talents here, air defense, so again, it can attack units that have flying, and also range two, so it can do a range attack. The one nice thing about the Sabisa, it does not have an attack stat. If it did, it would have retaliated, but a unit only retaliates once during a turn and this is all 
my turn. So Sabisa doesn't retaliate at all. It got wiped out. Cram did the final blow. So I'm going to give Cram a attack upgrade because it can take two upgrades. It has two little dots there. This is going to go away. And I'm going to get four source as a reward. Let me take my D20 instead of playing with that little blue chip over there. And that will do the blue chip's fine if it was like really close to me, but it's not really going to work for this video. So I have four source and that will help keep track of that. That is the end of my turn. So now we do the heirs' turn. So again, the heirs have three minions, but they are all stacked. They're all going to move as a group until they start getting defeated and then they'll come out one at a time. Something to note about when you stack minions, you cannot stack a faster minion on top of a slower minion because the slower minion would obviously slow down the faster minion thematically. If you're not grouping minions, you can put them in whatever order you want. But if you're grouping them, the slower minion has to be on top and the faster minion is virtually slowed down by that. The Harrier has to move all four of its movements. So you're going to see where can I go on this map that helps the Harrier make progress toward the Brondon Gate that still allows it to use all four of its movement. This is where you start to see some of the chessiness of this game. It's really interesting. Sometimes it feels really silly too. The Harriers do not have to move efficiently. They must make some progress if they can, and they must use all their movement if they can. So the Harrier is gonna move one, two, three, four, or it can move one, two, three, four. That's still made progress toward the gate. Again, the Harrier has no terrain allotment so it's only moving along this path or it can move one two three four why would i want to do that or I could do one two three four why would i want to do that no we're gonna make this thing go nice and slow give me some time to maybe get another landmark defeated it's gonna go one two three and four how is that progress well when you count progress you're going to count the terrain so from there it would have been one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen Notice you do count through other units. You don't count through spires or landmarks, but you do count through units. From here, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We made one hex of progress. Not a lot. It's still progress, so that's totally a legal move. One thing I should have said before I'm with the Harrier is that the Elfin Kazi would have been the leading minion. The Elfin Kazi would have checked the scene if it got adjacent to an opposing hero. It could not. It only has Roost Roam, Roost 3, so that only gets it to about here. But again, the dispatch doesn't matter. It's all about them trying to harm poor old Cram. What has he done except kill a Sabisa? <laughs> exactly. So we're done with the Harriers' turn. The Harrier move, the Alphankazi is just like, I'm still looking for a hero to blow up next to, blah, blah, blah. And uh, now we move on. We're going to go to the Bronze turn. Again, I can move Cram before or after the movement of the minions. I'm going to move him before. He's going to go one and two. I want to try to take advantage of the Elf and Kazi and be a little sneaky about it. So that's done. The dispatch is going to go one and two. Now, we can't go one, two because he's not making any progress if he goes off in that corner. But if he goes one, two, he makes one worth of progress toward the heirs' gate and again that is the mark for the brawn and minions and the battleborn has to move its full allotment if it can while still making progress it's going to go one and two it made progress we're going to look at spires cram is one two three away from that spire so he will absolutely get attacked by that spire but cram has a little bit of a trick so we're going to roll this die it does two damage cram has the armored talent so whenever it is attacked by a unit or by a spire, you reduce the amount of damage it takes by one, so that two becomes a one, cram is down to four health. So let's look at the other spires, and you can choose the order that spires attack. One, two, three, the dispatch is in range of this regal lookout. They're also just rolling one die, they only have one attack chip in their stack. It rolls, it rolls a one, so one damage to the dispatch. We're now going to do some exploring. We will look to see what this is. It is a Traxel loner. Yikes! Engage and foreboding. All right, what does that mean? Let's go to our cheat sheet here. Engage units able to attack this landmark must and foreboding. When you explore this landmark, you must reveal it. As I said before, sometimes the choice of revealing is taken out of your hands. It was absolutely taken out of my hands here, which makes me a little bit sad. So we're gonna put this down here. The Traxel loner 
only has a one attack stat, so that's not awful. And it'll retaliate the first time it is attacked this turn. I do want to try to keep this ditch patch alive just a wee bit longer. So we'll see. So the Battleborn is going to attack first. It does one damage because it has one attack stat. The Traxler Loner retaliates. Fine. The Dispatch is going to attack. It does one damage. And the Traxler Loner does not retaliate because it had already retaliated once this turn. That is the end of my turn. Cram is just chilling over here saying, I'm biding my time. And we'll see what happens next. The heirs are going to go. The leading minion is the Elfin Kazi. Again, they have a one, two, three, four, five. So they are absolutely way ahead of the Harrier, but they are not three away from Cram the Mighty. So they're just going to chill. The Harrier is going to move four. Now, when you're counting spaces for movement of the minions, you cannot go backwards on a space you already were on that turn. So the best we can do here if we're trying to keep the Harrier nice and slow is going one, two, three, and four. Legit movement. And we definitely made progress toward the gate of the Bronin. We're now going back to the Bronin's turn. Cram is going to move ahead of the minions. He's going to go one and two. He's going to chill right there. The dispatch is going to go one and two. The Battleborn is going to go one, two. I like it. Now, <laughs> when you're attacking with a Spire, when you have multiple objects, the Spires have different priorities. Last time, this Spire could only attack Cram, so it just attacked Cram. But now that there are three units within range of this high rise, one hero and two minions, we're going to go to the priority, which is at the back of the solo book. The priority of the Spire is current player's hero it can defeat, Current player's minion it could defeat. Current player's hero it can damage. Or current player's minion it can damage. When you're saying it can defeat, you do factor in things like armored, but you also assume a max hit. So this buyer is three away from the Battleborn. If it hits max, it could defeat it. So we're going to roll against the Battleborn. Hopefully not roll a two. I roll the one. Battleborn's down to one. And the high rise, well, the high rise could defeat the Battleborn, but... Even though the battle one has less chips, it also, if it rolls perfectly, could defeat the dispatch. I don't know if I want to take that risk, but they're all going to be blown up anyway. So I'm actually going to attack the battle one again with this high rise. It's probably going to be the end. Oh, it's whiffed. So the one sixth of this die is a whiff. One sixth of this die is a two. The other four are all ones. The battle born lives to fight another day. Don't worry. It's not going to last very long. This spire is not in range it has a mountain of fortifications but still only has range three so i don't have to worry about that the dispatch is going to attack this high rise this dispatch again has range two so it does one damage which knocks off the bottom chip of that high rise crams right next to it is going to knock off another chip from that high rise so that high rise is now down to one chip the battleborn would attack if there's anything it was adjacent to to attack there is not so at last that's all she wrote we now go to the heirs' turn. This is where it gets a little crazy. The Elfin Kazi, it is the leading minion. It's going to do its roost roam. It's going to come in. It has only one place it can go. It's going to go there. Boom. Two damage to cram. Now, it is not an attack, so armor does not trigger. But that two damage is going to happen to everything that is adjacent to that Elfin Kazi. So it's actually going to defeat the high rise. The high rise is out. The dispatch takes two damage. And Battleborn takes two damage. But you know what? Let me go back. I could have chosen not to attack with Cram, and I would have chosen not to attack with Cram because I want to try to get that sorcery reward. So the Elfin Kazi did two damage. Again, whenever any damage is taken by a Spire, just the bottom chip comes off, even if it's more than one damage. And that will mean that I will get the chance to kill the high rise as Cram and get that reward myself. But the Battleborn and the Dispatch are both out. So again, your minions that first round are a little bit just like fodder. They don't get a whole lot done, but now the Elfin Kazi is done, and we don't have to worry about that. So we're now going to finish the movement of the heirs, because again, we just moved the Elfin Kazi. The heirs move one, two, three, four, can absolutely go up there. No reason why I can't. It definitely made progress toward the Bronin Gate. Not efficient, but it is what it is. Cram's going to go. Cram is not going to move. We're going to look to see what spires are in range. That one high rise is in range. So Cram's getting attacked by one die. It rolled a one. That is an attack. Armor triggers. I don't take any damage. Cram now attacks. We finish off with high rise. And two things happen. One, we get the three source from defeating the spire ourselves. Thank you very much. And the second thing that happens is Cram is going to get another reward. And he's going to take a fortification chip just to be safe. High rise. Go, go. 
into the barracks for the heirs. Then we go to the heirs' turn. The heirs are going to go one, two, three, four. Now, the Harrier has something called Quick Strike. Quick Strike means that the Harrier is going to attack first before Spires would fire. It's pretty, pretty nasty. It also would mean that the Harriers would be able to wipe out this Traxor loner. And I do not want the Harriers to be the one to get that source. So I would rather be in a place where it will attack me. I did take another fortification and I do have armored. So it's actually not gonna be that bad for me just to take that attack myself. So I can make sure I take out the Traxor loner as well. Tram on his turn is gonna move one, two. The Harrier on his turn is gonna go one, two, three, four. Quick strike. I don't have any spires anyway. Quick strike only really matters if I have spires because it means it strikes before my spires would fire at it. Quick strike does two damage to me. It's reduced to one because of armored. I'm going to lose the bottom chip and then I retaliate two. I wipe out that Harrier. We're down to two now. I get one more source for that. So the seven becomes an eight and I can get a chip back. I'm going to get another fortification chip. Notice if I did not take a fortification chip the last time, and I took an attack chip that I would have been promoted. Not that worried about being promoted just yet. Cram's turn. Yeah, I think Cram's gonna take out this Harrier. That's fine. Cram's not gonna move. Cram's gonna attack this Harrier. It does two damage and we get another source. So that's nine. We would take another chip. Oh, we can't, we're full. So we get promoted. We lose the two level ups that we had before. And when we're promoted, since the promoted side has six health and the regular side of Cram has five, we do get another health chip from that. We have now added another skill. This extra skill is survival. That means that if I do not move and attack, so if I don't do anything with Cram on a turn, I can't move and I can't attack. If I do neither things on one turn as Cram, then I get to get a health back up to my max, which is nice. The one Harrier will goes away. Now the last Harrier is on the board and the heirs are gonna go now. The heirs are gonna move four. Again, it doesn't matter that they're adjacent to Cram. Their mark is this gate. That's all they care about. So the Harrier's going to go one, two, three, four. Quick strike against the gate. My gate goes from 10 health down to eight. Whenever a fortress gate is attacked, it always retaliates one, sometimes more, but always at least one. So this Harrier is down to its last health. And I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to move one, two with Cram. And I'm going to attack the Traxer. I do two damage. That wipes out the Traxer. I get four source from that, which gets me up to 13. Notice I did not worry about protecting my gate too much there. That four source from the Traxer could be really, really huge. Since I defeated the landmark, I get to do an upgrade. I will take a attack stat. The Harrier in its turn, it doesn't need to move. It's already by its mark. If there was like another path hex there, it could obsolete move sideways and make a lateral move. If it can't get any closer to its mark, you can always do a lateral move. The Harrier attacks two, the gate goes down to zero, retaliates again, wipes it out. Now I still get the source because it was my fortress that defeated that Harrier. So we are at the 14 source altogether, which is a big haul for the first wave. That makes me super happy, guys. I like it. We defeated one of their spires. We wiped out everything. We still have another landmark. I do want to see what that is as we go, but overall a pretty effective first wave. So it would be my turn now, since there are no faction minions at all on the board, it just triggers the end of the wave. If there was a hero from both sides on the board, this would trigger the end of the wave. If it was Cram and some of my minions, my minions would still carry out all of their turns and do all the ridiculous things that minions do. But Cram himself would go into campfire mode where he would just kind of chill. None of his skills are triggered. He can't gain health from survival or any of that stuff. He just kind of chills until the end of the round. Let's see what's going on. So we're gonna go to wave two. Wave two, the heirs are gonna have priority. We do roll the event die. I rolled a four. I think that's what I rolled last time, is it? Yes, I had a fortification chip to the bottom of two heirs spires. We're gonna do the same two. This big minute around the middle is gonna be the worst. <laughs> but I have some ideas, we'll see. We now go to the next phase, income phase. I have zero income again, but I have the 14 that I got in sorcery reward from the last week. We go to the market phase. These three chips go away. I'm going to put three new ones in their place and let's see if we get a minion that I can get. Ooh, we get the Oncariologist. Oncariologist has four health. 
The tax one has two movement. It is devoted, so ungrouped only. After or instead of its movement, this unit may be placed on or adjacent to a source well. It is now considered a landmark minion that is friendly only to the uprising. <laughs> As a build option during this build phase, you may return this minion to your barracks to construct the spire on the source well it occupied, ignoring influence restrictions. That's all sorts of crazy. It only costs two source, but there's a lot that has to go on with that. <laughs> we'll see. I'm considering it. We have the Barabund. He's evasive. The Barabund, when this unit is attacked by a unit with range, reduce the damage to one. There's not a lot of ranged units coming at us from the airs right now. And then we have the Phoenix, Quick Strike, and Swindle. Swindle is a little nuts. Swindle says... When this unit attacks or retaliates against faction units, do not deal damage. Instead, steal one source from that faction for each damage that would have been dealt. I can't steal source from the errors. So there's not a whole lot going there. The Barabun's interesting. I just don't know how helpful it's going to be. Oh, it's also a leader. Yeah, it's not even a minion. And I can't take another leader. And the Phoenix is also a leader. So the only one I could take is this Ankarologist. That doesn't make any sense. Let me refresh the... Oh. Terrain, these are both expansion terrains, that's funny. So this just counts as air, you can't do anything on it. So if I wanted to put a big hole in the middle of anchor, I could spend two to get that. In the market phase in a normal game, you have one opportunity to buy something, your opponent has one opportunity to buy something, and it is in order or priority, so the heirs could buy something first, and I have a chance to buy something. I just don't want to buy anything from that market, although that one minion is a little tempting. We now go to the build phase. The build phase tells me that I need to add an attack chip to the bottom of one spire of my choice. I will add this attack chip to the high rise. Notice it is underneath the fortification chip, which is totally fine. And then we'll do the prep phase. I am told that I'm gonna get seven command points plus I get to bring in the architect on the promoted side. Super strong, architect is a builder and I will show you what that means as we go. The heirs are going to bring in two promoted Harriers, a non-promoted Joust, and another promoted Harrier. Now we have two separate groupings. The two promoted Harriers are going to be on top in the first grouping, and then the Joust with the other promoted Harrier is going to be in the second grouping. The non-promoted Joust has three health, and we will have a good time with him. The Elfin Kazi is going to come back on the board here like so and now i have to figure out how i'm spending my seven cp well actually let's go back to the build phase how am i spending my 14 source is actually a much better question at this point so you can build as much as you can afford i'm also going to want to upgrade some things as well so to build a spire on a land you need influence over it so i have influence here because it's next to my fortress i need to build a spire here if i want to have influence here and i really want to get a certain kind of thing here I'm going to spend three of my 14 source to get me down to 11 to put a dispatch platform just to gain influence over this land group. And can I say hex? I'm talking about the whole hex grouping. I have 11 source left. I think this makes the most sense. I'm going to spend three to build another dispatch platform here. So I'm down to eight. Dispatch platforms have splash. So when a dispatch platform attacks, it deals one damage to all units adjacent to the target of the attack it may it has the option to and that's even if your basic attack fails which is super nice and now i have eight more source i'm going to spend all of it so i have zero source left and i'm going to upgrade both my battle board minions and my dispatch minions i think that's the right way to go this is not always what i would do i just kind of like how this is setting up for me in this game but we'll see i mean it's kind of <laughs> i've been wrong before so what have I done? I built two levels of the honor pit. What does that mean? Well, the honor pit, the first level, the Battleborn Arena games. All Battleborn minions are permanently promoted. So every time I put a Battleborn into play, it's still the same amount of CP, but now it's going to be a much better Battleborn. And all dispatches are permanently promoted as well. So I will do that. Dispatches now also have splash, just like the dispatch platforms. Dispatch, dispatch platform, lots of splash, super exciting. They also have air defense still and they're attacking with a two instead of a one the battleborn are also attacking with a two instead of a one so that's a really nice upgrade for both of them so we have to figure out how we're going to stack these suckers and we also have the architect who's upgraded too architect i really want to get out here and do a couple of quick upgrades on that dispatch platform 
if I get enough source, I can do special builds in the middle of a wave. You can do two of them in the middle of a wave. That's what these two dots down here are. So if I can get an upgrade on here and then do some things with the architect, that could be really, really nice. So I'm going to put the architect late. Cram has a movement of three. I think I want him to heal a little bit though, too. Maybe not. Graham, you feeling frisky? So the dispatch have a movement of two. The battleborns have a movement of three. I'm going to stack the battleborns. I get them to survive a little bit longer. I'm going to put the dispatch on top of them with move two, ungrouped. So the two battleborns are grouped. The dispatch is ungrouped. I'll put the architect last. The heirs are going first. They are the ones with priority. So the heirs have a Harrier on top. He's going to move four. We're going to go one, two, three, four. Again, we counted the last time. It is progress. And the Joust moves two, and we'll go there. My turn. Elfin Kazi is probably going to blow me up again, which makes me upset. I do want to see what's going on with that landmark before it's too late here. Cram's not going to move or attack this turn. The dispatch is going to go two, one, two. The Battleborn are stuck behind the Dispatch, and the Architect can't even get out of the home gate. Dispatch are like, what? Like, get out the way! I'm a Battleborn! Nope, you ain't going anywhere. So Cram gets one health back. I think that's super important. We're now going to go back to the Heirs. The Joust is the lead minion now, so the Joust is going to go one, two. The Harrier should try to move all four. It can't. It can't even move three. It can only move two of its four. It's going to go one, two, and it made some progress. We now go back to the Bronin. But this patch has three health. Not too sorry about that. Cram's going to chill again and get a health back. Take advantage of his survival. The dispatch is going to move one, two. No, Cram is in the way. Get out the way. Cram's going to move one back there so it doesn't get displaced. The Battleborn's going to move all three now. One, two, three. And the Architect's going to move three. One, two, three. So it did all of its movement. I do not... I repeat, I do not want to use the Builder Skill. What the Builder Skill is, it allows me to either promote an adjacent dispatch platform to a Siege Tower, which is huge. And I can do that even if I don't have access to Siege Tower yet on my board. It also allows me to add a upgrade. So I can add an attack chip, I can add a range chip, it's huge. So the Architect on this promoter side when it comes out, it can do that twice. Because the first time it does that, it's gonna go to its non-promoted side. And the second time it does that, it's gonna come off the board. If it's already on a non-promoted side where it gets put on the board, all that's gonna happen is this going to go away after it does it once, right? So having the promoted Architect is really huge. I'm really gonna try to save all of that goodness for over here. I think that's just gonna make a little bit more sense. We still have to worry about the spire. So after the movement step, we have this spire. All this is in range. It's going to roll one die against the Battleborn. It cannot defeat anything. So it's just going to go for a minion it can wound. If there was a hero could damage, that would be the priority. But since there's not, I'll have to go after the Battleborn. They're stacked. It did zero damage. Anyway, none of my minions can attack anything. That is the end of this turn. The heirs. The joust is going to move one, two. The Harrier is going to move one, two, three, four. It got all of its movement in. So exciting. They're still pretty far from both of my dispatch platforms, so I'm not able to do any damage there. We now go to the Bronze turn. The dispatch is going to go one, two. The Battleborn is going to go one, two, three. And the Builder is going to go one, two, three. These two Spires both have range. Cram, what am I doing with Cram? Ram's still going to chill back there, and he's going to get another health back. So this would happen technically at the end of the turn. So this Spire can, in theory, defeat either of these two minions. The Architect's not in range. So I'm going to have it attack the Battleborn with two dice. It does two damage. The Battleborn's down to one health. This is now going to attack the Battleborn because it can defeat it. It can't defeat the Dispatch. It's rolling one die. It misses. Wow, rolling really sickly good right now. The Dispatch is going to attack something within range 2. It has air defense, so it could, if it wanted to, knock out the Elf and Kasi. It doesn't want to do that. I think we just want to actually try to take this sucker down to size a little bit. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do one damage to that Regal Lookout. Battleborn doesn't have anything adjacent to attack. The Architect doesn't have anything adjacent to attack. The Dispatch can only attack there because it had range 2. Again, I could have knocked off one of these bottom shields. 
Honestly, <laughs> there's a lot of fortifications there. Not that worried about that just yet. We're going to go to the heirs this turn. Lead minion. Oh, we'll put this one health onto Crane now. So he's at five. So he's almost back to full. The Elf and Kazi lead minion is not three away from Cram. So he's not doing anything. Oh, shoot. I wanted to build that dispatch platform there. I would have built the dispatch platform here just so I had range to there. Because the first move of the game, the Elf and Kazi would have come in. It would have blown up. And if I had the dispatch platform there, it would have taken a thing off. So there'd been no point of doing that. So Cram started the round with three health. That would have made the most sense for sure. I was trying to do something cute with uh, trying to kill the Elf and Kazi with Splash. But yeah, once I realized that's still three away and then this is in a different place, that wouldn't have made any sense to build that. So just kind of a little revisionist history. Sorry about that. But that's how that really had to play out. To put a dispatch platform here when I know the errors are going first and I'm going to get blown up. Had I realized that on the first turn of the round, like definitely wouldn't have done that. That makes this a little bit more difficult, but I think we'll be fine. So that was the third turn with the Bronin. The heirs are going to take their fourth turn. They're going to go one, two, and they don't do exploration. That's only what you're going to do. And the Harrier is going to just go one, two, and get stuck behind the other one. Brana's turn. The Dispatch are going to move one, two. The Battleborn has to move one, two. And the Builder is going to go one, two, three. When the Builder is adjacent to the Dispatch platform, at the end of its movement, it's going to downgrade itself and is gonna promote the Dispatch Platform into a Siege Tower. Now the Spires are going to attack. The Regal Lookout cannot defeat the Dispatch, so it would attack the Battleborn. So we're gonna roll one attack there. It could also attack the Architect, but I think I wanna save the attack on the Minerf Architect and hope I don't roll two twos. So we attack, man, rolling really good. So zero damage to the Battleborn. And now the Minaret, since the Minaret can defeat the Battleborn, I'll have it roll two dice against the Battleborn. It does two damage that does defeat the first battleborn. The heirs are not going to get a source reward for that. If you were playing against another opponent, they would get two sources. At this time, battleborn just comes back into my barracks. We now do my various attacks. The battleborn want to kill all of them. So the battleborn is going to attack the regal lookout. The dispatch platform is going to attack the regal lookout. I get three source. So back from zero up to three. That's a huge get for me, and you'll see why in a second. So the Regal Lookout's out, and now we have another open source well. End of my turn. We're going to go to the Heirs' turn. The Heirs, the Jousts can't move and make progress. It also means that these Harriers can't get into the position to attack. The Joust is going to go, it's going to do a quick strike. So it's doing two damage to the Dispatch. The Dispatch, since it is adjacent to the Joust, will retaliate and do two damage back. The upgraded Joust has some other abilities that are super crazy. We'll see if we see them in the next round. The Harrier, again, also can't attack. So now we go to the Bronin's turn. Oh, yeah, the fourth turn for Cram, he would have healed again. This is now the fifth turn for the Bronin. Cram's going to heal again and just get him back to full health. He's doing nothing useful. So at the beginning of my turn, I'm going to use one of my special builds. I'm going to send three source to use one of my two special build options. And I'm going to do an upgrade to the Siege Tower. The Siege Tower only has two chips. Each additional range or attack chip I put on it is going to cost me whatever the cost is of the number of chip it is. Since this is the third chip, it's only going to cost me three. Nice go winky dink. The Siege Tower can only have four chips total. However, if you're actually upgrading with the Architect, you can actually ignore those restrictions. At the beginning of my movement with the Architect, I'm going to do my second special thing with it and I'm going to upgrade it to get another range. So this Siege Tower has Raise, which means the beginning of my turns in the future, now I can attack with it. I can attack an opposing Spire. It also is gonna be rolling two dice and it's gonna have range three. So it'll have range to this Minaret and it could just start taking that down one fortification at a time. But the Architect is now out because it did a special buildy thing twice. That was only movement. So now we look to see if there are spires that are going to attack. Now I should say with that raise, normally spires don't attack other spires. Raise is a very special ability for this siege tower. It's really cool. It's the reason why I cost six source if I was going to buy it outright as it was. I was able to put it at the board as a dispatch platform for three, did upgrade it for three, and then I was able to convert it and upgrade it again using the architect. 
This minaret is going to attack one unit that it thinks it can kill. It thinks it can kill the Battleborn because it can if it rolls perfect. Again, it's rolling two dice. It can get as much as four damage. Battleborn only has three health. It rolls three damage. It was correct. So we defeated the other Battleborn, but that gives me a chance to actually attack with the dispatch. Had the dispatch died, the Battleborn would not have been able to attack. So the dispatch is going to take out the Joust, and we get another Harrier unveiled. Looking at where I'm at, and those Harriers are going to be nasty for me now. I should move Cram, actually. Let me get him back in the action. He's going to one, two, three. Yeah, I can always do survival mode with him later. He's in a pretty good shape. So the Joust is out. That gives me two source. I keep this guy here as a reminder. So two source, Joust out. The Harriers are going to go. They can't move. They do quick strike, wipe out the dispatch. Dispatch had a really good run. My turn. I get to do a raise at the beginning of my turn. I'm raising against the Minaret. Do two damage. I take out the bottom fortification. I'm going to move with Cram. Cram's going to go one, two. Little dangerous, but this should work. He's going to get attacked by the Minaret. Rolling two dice. It does two damage. Armor reduces that down to one. Cram is now going to attack the Harrier. Two damage. And it's going to take an upgrade of a fortification ship. Put it at the bottom. And I get one source, so I'm up to three. Did forget I get a source earlier, too, for the first Harrier I defeated. So I'm actually up to four. Harrier out. This Harrier is going to go and is going to move one. It can't move any further. Now, minions will displace their own heroes, but they will not displace the heroes of the other side. This Harrier attacks me with Quick Strike. It Two damage becomes one. I lose my Fortification Chip, but then I do Retaliate. I do two damage. I get another source that gives me up to five. And I'm going to get a fortification ship back. Two health underneath this Harrier. My turn, rolling two dice against the Minaret. Because again, I have range three. Two dice, I do two damage. Bottom fortification ship comes out. Cram is going to move here. To get out of range of the Minaret. Totally legit. The Harrier is going to go one, two, three, four. Priority tells it to attack Cram. Because that is an opposing hero, it can damage. It's going to want to damage the opposing hero before it damages a spire. It does quick strike. So two damage because one, I lose a fortification chip. Retaliate, get it back. You get the source, get out the six source. And this Harrier is out. That's the end of the wave. There are no faction minions. We can go to wave three. Decent progress for sure. Getting those siege tower there would be nice. Then we can start taking out this high rise, but we're going to have some more things to worry about. So we have to roll the event die at the beginning of wave three. I rolled the one. What does the one do? The one tells us to add another attack chip to Darb. Again, base attack of a one. Now we just made her attack a three. She has flying. It can only get attacked by something with air defense, but it also will take retaliation damage, splash damage, whatever. We also don't have to worry about the elf causes anymore because that high rise is no longer a concern. We're gonna to go to the income phase, zero source. We go to the market phase as normal. So these three chips go away. This goes away. What do we have here? We have the anarchist. It costs one source to get. The anarchist is a little nuts. Before it changes movement each turn, if you roll a five or a six, it's just discarded. So you're spending one source to maybe get something awesome. <laughs> How lucky do I feel? The fashioner could be huge, improve. So the fashioner only has one attack, but it's got four health. It's got three movement. It does cost three to get, but it has improved. What an improve means is that when this unit ends its movement adjacent to a friendly spire, you may spend two source to, to any upgrade to that spire. Could be really nice. I'm not very rich in source right now. And then we use a five source to just get a basically generic spire. Not really feeling the blade wall. Still in the anarchist a little bit, but I actually think I'm going to get the smelter and give myself the ability to build a siege tower there directly without the architect. Probably the best. So let me get the smelter. I really like the Aegis usually. The Aegis or the Agus, I'm guessing is pronounced. So it's armored like Cram, is a super strong. And then when it's upgraded, it has assault. So you can take away two chips at the bottom of the spire at once. So I sent all six of my source. I upgraded the smelter. Brawn and steel siege towers and launch tower spires can now be constructed. The launch tower spires are spires that have air defense, but the 
ability to do raise and attack opponent spires is really important in this scenario. So I have no more source. That was the build phase. And now we go to the prep phase. I'm only gonna have nine command points and I don't get the bonus upgraded architect that I got in wave two, which is super nice. The heirs are gonna get an upgraded Harrier that comes into play with two health. It is ungrouped. It's also gonna get a upgraded Joust and two upgraded Harriers that comes into play grouped. So that comes in with four health and the regular Joust only had three and had two movement. This Joust has three movement and has four health. So pretty substantial upgrade there. And also what's coming into play, we are gonna finally see Darb. Hello, Darby. How are you doing over there? And Darb is at the bottom of the stack on its upgraded side, as discussed earlier. With my nine CP, I don't know what I want. I might get an Aegis anyway. It's just really nice. The armored really can do some wonders. That would be four. If I get an Aegis, a Dispatch, and a Battleborn, I don't hate it. You do need to be careful about doing too well in this game. You don't want to defeat the gate in wave three, because again, I have to wipe all those suckers out. Slowing out a little bit might make some sense. So I'm going to get an upgraded dispatch, an upgraded battleborn, and a regular old Agus. What's up, Agus? Yeah, I'll put him at the top. So he comes into play with three health. You got two movement. The dispatch has three health. Two movement. The battleborn has three health. Three movement. It won't group anyone. Just kind of figure out how we want to work this. And the Brawnen do have priority this turn. Get Cram back a health, knowing that Darb is attacking with three. So he's not going to move or attack this turn. At the beginning of my turn, though, I am forgetting my raise ability. Two damage. Getting lucky there. Not rolling any zeros. Agus is going to go one, two. Dispatch goes one. And that's all she wrote. And then Cram's going to get back up to four health. We're going to go the heirs this turn. The heirs have a Harrier on top. We're going to go one, two, three, four. A Joust, we're going to go one, two, three. The Darb, move allowance, it can go anywhere. It's going to go one, two. It can move on water. It can move anywhere it wants. And again, that is one step closer to Cram because that is Darb's focus. That's where it wants to go. It's not worried about the gate. It just wants to kill Cram. I know, lots of violence here. We're gonna now go to the Bronin's turn. Bronin are gonna raise only one damage, so it did not go through the fortifications. I spoke too soon last turn. Cram's gonna go one, two. Agus is gonna go one, two. Dispatch is gonna go one, two. And Battleborn is gonna go one, two, three. There are no spires to attack us. We are gonna explore. It's a thorax, toxic secretion. So again, just like the Sabisa, if you move next to it, you take a damage. We'll be able to defeat this guy pretty quick. I'm gonna use a dispatch to get two damage on it. The dispatch is not adjacent, so it does not get retaliated against it, but the thorax doesn't have retaliated anyway. And now Cram's gonna do two damage plus the one because it still has that attack upgrade. So it's gonna knock it out. Cram cannot upgrade anymore, so it will not. We get five source for that. Give me my handy dandy die over here and remind me that I have five source to spend. The heirs are gonna go. So I can move Dar before or after the minions. I'll move Dar before. One, two. The Harry's gonna go. One, two. Oh, it displaces Darb. Sorry, Darb. Three, four. And the Joust is gonna go. One, two. Oh, it displaces Darb again. Three. So again, heroes cannot prevent their own minions from advancing. It's super convenient. I can just have them come at me, but you know, whatever, it's fun. The Siege Tower is gonna go, it's rolling two dice. Go, oh, bricked again. Oh, it was too cocky. Cram is not gonna move this turn. Let's get him back to full health once and for all. He still has two more he can take. I'm just gonna put that there as a reminder. Agus is gonna go one, two. Can't move here because it doesn't make any progress that way. The Dispatch is gonna go one, two. That is progress. And the Battleborn is gonna go one, two, three. The minaret's going to attack Agus. It's rolling two dice. It does two damage. Agus is armored, so it only loses one health. Beautiful thing. Cram. Airs are going to go. The Harrier's going to go one, two, three, four. The Joust is going to go one, two, three. And Darb is going to go one, two. So Quick Strike would go. They're not adjacent to anyone. The Siege Tower is going to attack the Harrier. 
do damage. So just because it says raise as an additional ability doesn't mean it doesn't function like a normal spire as well. The Harrier is dead. We get one source. It gets me up to six. The beginning of my turn, the Sea Sour is going to attack the Minaret. Two damage. We lose another fortification. So I have two rounds of whiffing. Nice to knock one of those off. The Agus is going to go move one, two. These guys are tied, so I can choose which priority I want to go with. I want to use a dispatch first, so one, two. And the Battleborn's going to go one, two, three. They all made progress. The Minaret can choose who it's going to attack. It's going to attack the Agus because it can, in theory, defeat it. Cram's just going to get another health this turn and then finally start getting back into the action next turn. And two damage to Agus. Agus armored kicks in because it was attacked. It only takes one. Dispatch is going to do an attack two, range two, knock that off the minaret, and Cram finally gets back to full health. We now go to the heirs. Joust is going to go. It can't go any further. Darb is going to move one, two. Again, it's going after Cram and Cram alone. Joust quick strikes. Yoink, two damage. It is enough to kill Agus. So there's no retaliation because Agus is no longer around. Oh, it also has Eager and Fury Kick. Let me explain what this does. Almost forgot. How could I forget? So this is the upgraded Joust. It's pretty nasty. When the shooting attacks a minion, displace the minion prior to dealing damage. So it would have displaced Agus there. And then Fury Kick, when this unit attacks, it deals damage to all opposing units adjacent to it, but only the target unit attacks. So in theory... It's like doing a kick, like around in a circle, but only Agus would have been able to retaliate. Agus is out, but the air dispatch does take two damage as well. So it's pretty brutal the way that kind of works out, but it's cool. I like it a lot. Since that was quick strike, they went before everything. It just, it's just kind of hard to learn against the airs because you don't really get to the rhythm of the game because so many of their enemies have quick strike. It does take a little bit to really get the rhythm down. So I find it easier against the other factions in the next few scenarios. But we are going to attack with the Siege Tower after the Joust movement. We did three damage to the Joust. It is down to one. Now it's the Bronin's turn. The Siege Tower is going to do its raise. It does two damage. Minaret's getting whittled further and further. We're going to move can't we have a joust in front of us so cram's gonna move in here one two let's get rid of this joust because he's nasty the minaret's going to attack with range three two dice it could defeat this minion it could defeat this minion it's going to go after the battleborn with two dice and only does one damage that means that we have the dispatch around dispatch is going to do range two it has air defense so we can attack darb even though darb is flying it does two damage to darb and Cram is going to attack the Joust and do three damage, only needs to do one. The Joust is out. We get two more CP, gets us up to eight. And now we have two Harriers. Joust out. We go to the Air Discern. The Harrier can't move anymore. Darb is going to move and get adjacent to Cram. We can attack on anyone we want. The Harrier is going to attack a minion it could defeat before it attacks a hero. It can only damage. It does two damage to the Dispatch. Dispatch is out. And then Darb attacks Cram, is doing three damage. Cram is armored, so Cram only takes two. And then Cram retaliates three, which is enough to wipe out Darb. However, what happens? Darb just flips over, loses its upgrade, and stays at the health that it had at the time, which was the three health. No source for that because Darb wasn't actually defeated. It dodged, kids. That's what it did. But now, Darb's kind of a weenie. We're going to go to the Bronin turn. The Siege Tower is going to affect the Minaret. Nice. Minaret is down to zero fortifications. Just has range and attack chips. The Battleborn is going to move because it has to. The Minaret is going to attack the Battleborn with two dice. It only does one damage. Getting really lucky with that. Bram will attack the Harrier. Two damage. One more source gets me up to nine. And Cram can get an upgrade back. It's going to take a defense chip back. Airs his turn. The Harrier, the Harrier can't move. Darb can move laterally if it wanted to. We don't have to. Like, we can make it move wherever, but we'll just leave it there. It's already adjacent to its target. So the Harrier is going to attack the Battleborn. It does quick strike, two damage. And I think I might have forgot to do this last turn. I think I forgot to have the Siege Tower fire. It's not a big deal. Siege Tower is going to fire now. Two damage. Again, quick strike really throws off some of the tempo. That's one more source. It gets me up to 10. And now Darb attacks Cram, does one damage, becomes zero damage. Cram still retaliates because it was attacked. 
three attack back and we wiped out darb we get one source for that that's 11. so now we go to the final wave so what's our goal we need to finish wiping out these two towers and we also need to do 10 damage to the gate right cram can do a lot of this himself this siege tower is really doing a lot to handle that minaret so not a lot to be concerned about here but we'll see if we can pull it off in the end so we go to round four where are the wave rules the errors are going to have initiative we have to roll the event die i roll the five what happens to a five i think that's pretty nasty we get an ungroup promoted joust going to be added to the battle queue at the bottom the rest of the battle queue is going to be a win rush a royal talon that are grouped they're both not promoted and then the three promoted harriers are back one more time because we have not seen enough of them the wind rush comes in it has five health now it has assault and transport so assault is if it were attacking a spire of mine it would take out one chip and then attack so it could theory take out two the transport doesn't really apply for the ai but really what it means if i were using that skill i could change the order of speed so i could have a slower minion underneath a faster minion in a group which could be really strategically advantageous in a lot of circumstances so i kind of blew through the income the market and the build phase so sorry about that just wanted to get that done remind myself what's going on we'll do the market phase these three go out this goes out the next market chips we have are a spire another spire and a portal hopper camouflage and incorporal camouflage units and spires must be adjacent to this unit in order to attack it interesting i don't hate that incorporal means this unit may move through opposing units but cannot end its movement on the same hex as another unit steal what's first from the controlling faction for each unit it passes through it's interesting it only has one health so that's like a huge kind of a non-starter so that's the market phase we go to the build phase what do I want to build that I really care about? I mean, I could get the Forsaken out. The Forsaken's just bananas. <laughs> the Forsaken's really nuts. So I'm going to promote the Agus. That cost me five, so I have six source left. And then I think in the build phase, I'm just going to build the Siege Tower here. I do have influence over that Hex, and it comes into play with one attack and two range. Could really help speed some things up that I want to see happen. Might not be long for this world, especially with the Assault thing over here but I kind of like the idea of it. During the build phase, the heirs construct a minaret spire on a source well of my choice. So they're gonna get another minaret. It has one attack and one range chip. I can put this here. It's time to get the source siege. I just don't know. Eh, source siege is interesting. Nah, no, I wanted the source siege. I really like the source siege. I just don't think it's gonna make the most sense. I'll get the Agus. Two Battleborns and a Dispatch again. And I will group the one Agus over the Battleborn. So that's three health. I'll put them at the bottom. Battleborn, three. Dispatch, three. So again, the Dispatch cost me three. The two Battleborns cost me two each. So that's seven. And then the Agus cost me four. Ayers' turn. The Ayers are going to do this Windrush thing. Again, it still has to be on the pass. So one, two, three, four. The Harriers have four, one, two, three, four, and the promoted Joust at the bottom that was added because of the event die. Thanks, event die has three, one, two, and three. My turn. I'm going to do a raise attempt on this minaret. Two damage. It only becomes one. Again, we don't need the shields anymore. This siege tower is going to attack that minaret over there. Two damage. Yoink. I'm going to move my minions first. My dispatch is going to move one, two. Battleborn moves one. And Agus can't get out the gate. Cram, I will move one, two, three. Has raised, nothing has range to attack me. Again, this is my spire. Those are the air spires. Again, this one only has one range now. That one has zero range. This one has zero range. The airs are going to move. The Harrier is now the leading minion because one, two, one, two, three. This can only move three, one, two, three. So it has four movement, it only move three. Still makes progress. The Harrier is going to do a quick strike. It will prioritize damaging me over a Spire. It does one damage to me. Cram retaliates, two damage to the Harrier. I get a source. Source at this point really is going to be useful just for the limited build options. Again, you get two of those a wave. So after the quick strike, now my spire can attack. This siege tower is going to attack 
this joust with one die. Zero damage. Awesome. My turn. Siege Tower is going to try to raise this high rise because I think getting that damage ability off of it early is going to help. So one damage knocks that out. We're rolling two dice against this minaret with this siege tower. We only have one damage. That's all we need. So no more range on that minaret. We're going to move the minions first. One, two, one, two, three is not going to get me closer. So that would not be progress. That'd be lateral. So I'm only going to move two and go there. And this Agus goes here. Cram will just chill. No spires are firing at me. Cram's going to attack this Harrier. We get another source. Cram can take an upgrade chip, which he surely should have done last turn. We'll take a fortification. This batch is going to attack this Minaret. We get another source. That's three. The Harrier is going to move. Can't move. The Joust is stuck. The Windrush is stuck. Caused a bit of a traffic jam. The... Harrier is going to do a quick strike against Cram. Two damage becomes one. Lose the fortification chip. Retaliate. This Harrier is out. Get the fortification chip back as an upgrade. This Siege Tower is going to attack that Joust. One damage. My turn. Siege Tower is attacking a Minaret. Two damage becomes one because we're only taking out the bottom chip. This Siege Tower is attacking the same Minaret. Three damage becomes one. This Minaret's out. I get one source. So up to four. That was, again, the raise ability. So we do the minion movement. I'll do the minion movement first. One, two. That is progress. The Battleborn is going to go one, two, three. The Agus is going to go here. Cram is going to go one, two. This high rise Spire is going to attack Cram. I rolled a one. Cram is armored. He's good. Cram's going to attack the Joust and kill it. So we get two CP for that. Up to six. Airs are going to go. Windrush is going to go one, two, three, four. This Spire is going to attack it because it does not have Quick Strike for once. Attacking it with one die, it does no damage. Windrush is going to attack. It has Assault, so this comes off and then it attacks for one. It takes two range chips off of my newest Siege Tower. How dare you? How dare you? Raise. I have nothing to raise. <laughs> Cram's going to stay here, start taking care of that dude we really need to get a little worried about this wind rush right now battleborn's gonna go one two three dispatch is gonna go one two agus is gonna go one cram's gonna stay there he's gonna get attacked by the high rise one damage armored he does three damage take off the fortification chip the wind rush is gonna go it can't move any further because of the battleborn it is going to prioritize defeating that spire over attacking the battleborn for sure. However, we get to take two pot shots at it. It's still adjacent to the siege tower, so we're going to do one attack. That's two damage. This siege tower is doing two dice, two more damage. It's going to take out the siege tower. We're going to do the Brondon's turn. The Bronin's turn, again, nothing to raise. So Battlemore's the leading minion, but it's stuck behind the Windrush. Dispatch is going to go here. Agus is going to go here. Cram will stay where it is. Cram's getting attacked by the High Rise. No damage. Cram will attack, take this off. So Cram is done. Battlemore's going to attack the Windrush. Windrush goes away. No source reward. And what do we have? The Royal Talon. The Royal Talon has five health. It's flying. The Dispatch is air defense, so it's going to do three damage. We now do the Royal Talons, the Air's turn. The Royal Talons is going to move one, two. Again, it's flying, so it is all land types. It's going to attack. It only attack the Agus. The Agus has three health and armored. The Royal Talons doing three damage, so it's two damage. The Agus retaliates. It does two damage back. Again, it's flying, but retaliation still works. The Royal Talon, what's its mark? It's going to be the Bronin's Fortress Gate, so we're good there. Bronin's turn. Again, can't raise anything battleborn's going one two three dispatch one two the agus goes one cram stays right there roll the die because of the high rise still doing one attack we're good cram's going to attack first that's done the dispatch is going to attack here kill the royal talon we get up to 10 source and nothing else to attack there are no more minions or heroes left for the heirs Cram immediately enters campfire mode. I'll put that on there to mark that. He cannot attack. He cannot be attacked. He can't be targeted. He's just there. Nothing going on with him. But our minions are still going to carry out their turns. The Battleborn moves three. 
one, two, three. Dispatch moves two. Agus moves one. High Rise is going to attack the Battleborn with one die, one damage. Again, you don't retaliate against Spires, but now for his turn, the Battleborn is going to attack the High Rise. We get three source. We're up to 13 source. High Rise is out. We just keep doing my turns because all we have are my minions. Battleborn moves three. One, two, three. Dispatch moves two. Agus moves one. The Battleborns finally attack in the air's Fortress Gate. It goes down to eight. It takes one damage. Go again. Battleborn is already at its mark. Can't get closer, so it doesn't move. Dispatch moves one, two. Agus moves one. Battleborn attacks. It does two more damage. Down to six. Gets retaliated on. It's down to zero. The Dispatch has range. It's going to attack. We get down to four. It does take one in retaliation, even though it's not adjacent. Fortresses always do one retaliation, no matter where the unit is and what their range is. We go to the next turn. Dispatch is going to get adjacent to its mark. Agus goes here. Dispatch attacks, does two damage. Retaliated for one. Next turn, Dispatch stays where it is. Agus moves one. Dispatch attacks, does two damage. The Fortress Gate is defeated. Retaliation still happens. So the Dispatch <laughs> goes out a hero, but that is us succeeding with all three of our scenario goals and getting the max three renown Woo! all right that's cool i mean that's class fire man it is a lot there's a lot going on it's really pretty nuts the grove tenders will be scenario two might be a good introduction to them the one thing i guess makes sense if you're trying to write a really good story is i kind of wish the solo scenarios matched up all of the factions against the other factions i thought Going in, it was like, oh, the Brawnen will face each of the factions once, and the numbers kind of worked out for that. But really, it just depends on the narrative. So we defeated the heirs, well, at least for now. <laughs> Spoiler alert! We will go in to attack the Grove Tenders next time. We'll face the Grove Tenders again the time after that, and then we'll see what's left of the heirs in Scenario 4. And at that point, that is the end of the Brawnen four solo scenarios that come with the base game uh, and we'll kind of figure out where the story goes from there but this is a really cool little challenge it is a tough introduction to the game learning this game against the errors i think look as much as shift three games i think they're getting better at like helping people get eased into their games i think the latest unbreakable kickstarter is a great example they have some really good tools within that crowdfunding campaign on game found that i thought were really really helpful if you were kind of new to the game coming in it's like oh you're thrown into the airs with the elf and kazi which are super confusing and then you don't learn the tempo right it's like they move i fire oh no they move they quick strike and then i and then you're just so much more bound to just forget a step. Sometimes exceptions help you learn the rhythm of a game. And sometimes I think they get in the way of learning the rhythm of a game. And I just think this is more the latter and how it kind of plays out because you just can't get into, all right, movement, spires, fire, exploration. It's like, no, movement, attack, spires, fire. Don't forget that. I do like how the solo scenarios though force you to learn all of a faction. You know, if you're going to get really competitive in this game, I think these solo scenarios are great exercises in learning everything a faction has to offer, every different ways that you can upgrade them. This scenario, you don't really need to get to the Forsaken. You don't need to do too much with your Lance launchers and things like that. But as the scenarios go, that becomes more and more of an important thing to do. Getting the raise ability to take out that huge minaret with all those extra fortifications was so great. But then you saw I just had Cram take care of this one by himself at the end because he just has, you know, the armor. And you notice like this, I mean, I never once fired with this dispatch platform, not once. So it could have just left it there the way it was. It could have been reduced by the Elf and Kazi and it would not have mattered one bit, which I find funny. But I've definitely gotten to the place with some of these scenarios where I've just played them enough that I just have to pull back. Because, wow, you have too many minions that are just doing too much damage to the Fortress Gate. You're like, no, I have goals to meet and wave four people do not kill the gate. It also becomes more true when a lot of the solo scenarios do have more than four waves. So you're dealing with five waves. You have to pace yourself because if you do too much damage too early and you're really chasing that three renown, well, it's going to be hard to get it when you've uh, demolished half the fortress in wave two, dude. That's an interesting part of the game. I could see it being a little bit too gamey for some people. 
it's not very thematic for these big brutes to kind of hold back because they're like, no, we want to make them suffer a little bit longer before we wipe them out, right? <laughs> but in how it's built and how it's kind of testing your mastery of the game, testing your flexibility with changing game states, I do think it's a really nice part of it. And it does add to the replayability where it's like, I really want to get three renown. I beat this scenario seven times, but how do I get to the three renown? Like, how do I crack that code? How do I solve that puzzle? Right. It's super cool. So really excited to finally get this monkey up my back. Filming a game of Cloudspire was something I've been wanting to do for months now. I just kept getting too into too many bones and sidetracked by other things and whatever but uh this one it's a solid game this one's a pretty intense pretty incredible game i have so much more to explore with it there's just a guaranteed quality of gameplay experience that i think comes out every time you set this up and it's a beast to set up make no mistake but every time you set up there's a guaranteed like man i'm gonna have a puzzle that I'm going to engage with right now for a while. It's just really well done in that sense. You know, if you want the zany, yeah, go for too many bones. It's just a different kind of feel, different kind of vibe. This one has some elements that are just like funny and like goofy and whatever. It's still chip theory games. You will note I don't have the big spires. I don't feel a huge need to get them from a practical standpoint. It's just more to set up, more to store, more to deal with. And then to get chips off the bottom, like, it would have been really annoying to have to move that thing every time I want to get a chip off that giant minaret. So it does help you analyze the game state a little quicker. I mean, I've heard that and I could definitely see that, especially I got all these lights down on this table, which really helps for my camera, but it makes visibility hard for me. And I'm like, wait, what color is that spire? I can't see. It's like, yes, my eyesight is turning 70. I might only be in my forties, but I swear my eyesight is getting into my seventies before the rest of my body is really ridiculous. But Super fun. This was really cool. Really excited to see some of the feedback on this one. Please, please bring the comments. You see something I'm doing wrong, a strategy I might want to consider. You know, please let me know. If you're seeing this unit that I published it, please come back, check the top pinned comment in a couple of weeks. Make sure there's no rules mistakes that I'm making here. Digesting this game is quite the task and uh, glad to be kind of on the other side of that, at least as far as I am, no doubt. So, if you want to see the upcoming schedule, you can go on my Patreon page. That is in the link in the description below. I put out a schedule about a week before every month to let you know what is coming up in that month to come. Additionally, if you want to consider supporting solo playthroughs, especially as we round out another year in solo playthroughs land, please do. I have really enjoyed getting to know some of my patrons over the last year and a half, and it's been really fun to add that to this channel. And it has allowed me to make more investments in this channel to really have improved quality around here in ways that I'm really excited about. So who knows what will happen in the next year to come, but hopefully it is more good things here in Solo Playthroughs land. It's been really a joy to see this channel grow. And if more people wanna come on board with me from the Patreon standpoint, that'd be super appreciated. And everyone, Patreon or not, please thank you for the likes, the comments, all the things that people do to support this channel has been really meaningful to me. Until next time, whenever that is, happy gaming.